Hi everybody, thanks for joining us for another edition of Hold My Drink, where we navigate the news and politics with a chaser of civility. I'm your host, Jen, inviting you to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and imagine with us how to create a new American identity together. Welcome to this week's Hold My Drink. I have a follow-up with my friend Tom Easton, Eastman, the co- constitutional lawyer. After our last conversation, the world seemed to turn on its head even more. I think like every five minutes, Tom, something happens and we miss like that five minute window from when we recorded to when the Capitol, <laughs> there was a, um, call it what you will, siege, uh, whatever, we'll, we'll actually, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so today is our follow-up on on kind of political violence and, and constitutionalism and, and from our first conversation. But as you know, before we get into all that, the first question for you is, what are we drinking for this conversation? Today, we are drinking a virgin screwdriver. Ooh, which is... Also Which known is as orange juice. I, <laughs> yeah, we. I represent a, a citrus rancher, and he spotted me a crate of uh, organic Valencias, and this is brilliantly good. Well, you know, I always like to surprise you as a friend of mine. So I'm drinking wine because that's what I do. But um, this kind of goes to our conversation. So I've got to give a little intro. This cup is from Ranger Up, which is a kind of a military outfitter type store. And the cup says, I am comfortable with violence, (laughs) Ah. which is not really the case. And that's what we're going to talk about. Particularly, I'm very not comfortable with political violence. But I thought, you know, tongue in cheek, I would drink out of this cup for our conversation today. Uh, And that brings us to the topic. I mean, after we talked for the last podcast, the Capitol building was overrun. we you have a lot of strong thoughts on that. I think that we're going to agree on some points and disagree on some others. So I really just want to start off with asking you. I know I, again, I know that you have some some um, very deep thoughts on what happened. And so go go, give us your view, and I'll jump in. So I will start out with a quote from Abraham Lincoln in his uh, Lyceum Address before the Civil War, uh, the one that uh, Disney's Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln borrows heavily from. It's the one where one of the lines is, as a nation of free men, we must live for all time but or die by suicide. Uh, but the bottom line of the speech was against political violence in a republic. Uh, the money quote is, there is no grievance that is a fit object for redress by mob law. And it was interesting. In the aftermath of the riot on Capitol Hill, uh, I was having some Facebook discussions with some liberal academics who got quite angry with the idea that political violence in a republic is always wrong. Uh, their attitude was that, look, our causes are more inherently just than yours, And so uh, we can't just have a rule against all political violence. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it brings about necessary social change. But you guys, your political violence, that's always treason, sedition, and just a horrible thing. And I don't know if you want to weigh in there, but I have some strong thoughts about how suicidally stupid that idea is. I think that's that's where we're going to probably agree the most, is I don't think there is a place for political violence. I think that it's a slippery slope where you allow one place, it, you know, it moves on to another place. I do have some serious problems with what happened in the Capitol. And I know that you have some issues about whether or not we call it sedition. You have some questions on whether or not Trump actually incited it. And I know those are all things that we're going to go into. So no, I I would agree with you there that I don't think any political violence is ever acceptable. But before we get into the questions of sedition and incitement and whether or not Trump did this, you know, I mean, a lot of people would say, though, this country was born, right, on political violence. I mean, we have militias to protect us from the government. So these people feeling that the government had failed them. And again, I, I this, these aren't things I agree with, but were were they acting out in the American spirit, could you say? So I have some long distant cousins who uh, uh, were standing on Lexington Green, uh, the Parkers. They, in fact, most of the people on Lexington Green were cousins with each other. It was a very family thing. Uh, 
the critical thing is we are talking about political violence in a republic. Now, Sam Adams, who was probably the most firebrand of the Boston, the New England founders, his brother John Adams was always having to rein him in. Uh, it was interesting. Once uh, independence was won, once the uh, the colonies had become independent states, there was what was called the Shays uh, the Shays or Shays Rebellion. There was a rebellion over taxes in the back country, and. Uh, Sam Adams wanted to hang everybody after Washington put the rebellion down. He said that, look, treason in a monarchy is one thing. You know, a, a monarch can admit of uh, forgiving traitors because they don't really have any choice. But in the Republic, you know, it's, it's unacceptable. As it turned out, Washington didn't actually hang people. He figured that that probably would be pouring gasoline on the, or whatever the equivalent of gasoline in the 18th century was on the fire. <laughs> but that's the distinction. The Declaration of Independence says that you know, prudence indeed will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for lighter transient causes. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, this is from memory, so I miss, may miss a word here. Oh my gosh, I can't even believe that you're saying this from memory. Keep going. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and here's where I go wrong. Right. When a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. And the distinction between Lexington Green and today is that we do, and I think most of us agree, we do still have a functioning republic. Uh, in 1775, uh, the British crown, the, uh, America was probably one of the most democratic polities in the world. Uh, and England was not far behind, but the British crown at the time was trying to take away what relatively little liberty was there. Um, you know, and that's basically why, you know, Jefferson wrote that big long train of abuses and usurpations said, look, we're not represented anymore. Uh, we don't have any, any democratic means to, to change things. We, we have to appeal to heaven. We have to appeal to arms. That's the last resort. And I don't think we're anywhere close to the last resort. I don't think that, uh, you know, even if, you know, heaven forbid, there was significant cheating in the last election. I don't think, you know, we've had that before, right? You know, 1876 was lousy with cheating. 1960 was probably decided by cheating. Uh, you only break the glass and start swinging when there is absolutely no hope of fixing things. Okay, so this is very interesting. This uh, this will get into now Trump, and this is where I think we might disagree. I believe that Trump's rhetoric, while it might not have been, you know, we can argue whether or not it actually incited it, his rhetoric left people to think that we are at that, that stage. There is nothing left. If we do not go and fight, if we do not stand up for what's right, we're done. So his rhetoric really put us in that level where there is there is there's one way or the other you choose yeah and i think we'll probably i'll let you uh lead into you probably got some questions that'll segue into what constitutes incitement under the law but uh, uh it was certainly irresponsible uh i'm concerned with this idea that if you even if you just talk about controversial subjects like you know i got cheated the election was illegitimate that that count that constitutes rebellion, you know. I, I'm not ready to say that because, at, you know, one thing we've got to we've got to get clear. Uh, probably the most obscene word in democratic discourse is "whataboutism." Mm. So, right, you know, that word defines arguably something legitimate and real. If I'm trying to say, well, I'm not wrong because what about your emails? What about something else that somebody else did totally differently? That's one thing, but it's more often used as a, I don't care if we did exactly that thing that we're now attacking you for. Uh, the rules don't apply to us. It's different when we do it because we're the good guys. You know, sit down, get in line and behave. And that's not sustainable. Uh, so when I point out that I condemn this, uh, where is the condemnation of things that differed maybe only in degree, if that, in the past? You know, when they stormed the, the Wisconsin Capitol violently in 2010 and, uh, you know, threatened the life of the governor and chased the legislators out and shattered the windows, 
Nancy Pelosi said that was a beautiful example of democracy. I, I can't remember her exact words, but that's literally the words, the, the effect. You know, we can't take this idea that we can sort of fudge around the edge of political violence, but the other side can't. And I'm not drawing an exact equivalence. Uh, I think as we talked about last time with the issue of qualified immunity, you know, the important issue is, you know, how close the similarity between two precedents do we require before we think they have the same principle? Well, I mean, I think for me, though, uh, I, 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 again, this is where we agree. I do not think that the violence that we've seen over this past year was acceptable. And we saw a lot of, and this is what I read into what you write, we saw a lot of acceptance of that violence as a way to get what we wanted. And so your argument, as I understand it, as I've read it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that how can you expect people who have seen that kind of violence and it actually getting people results and not expect other people to react the same way. So you talk a lot about game theory and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and your ideas of game theory. My issue is not with that because I agree with you there. And I, and I think that we have been uneven in how we apply these principles. That said, I do think what happened and the way President Trump handled it was not presidential. So I guess the first, having said all that, spewed all that, <laughs> my first question to you is explain to us your idea of game theory and why this happened in the first place. And then we'll talk about Trump more specifically. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure we can we can boil down what happened to just one thing, but I certainly don't think it think it helps when one faction normalizes political violence and then is surprised, shocked. I'm shocked, shocked to find rioting is going on here, like in Casablanca, right? Um, I don't think I, that's not that's not excusing people. That's not casting blame. Uh, that's not rationalizing. But if we want to create a culture where this sort of thing doesn't happen, it cannot just be with one side hammering the other and saying, look, you guys just suck. Uh, the problem is all yours. Uh, the problem is you've got tens of millions of people on one side who are, are seeing their concerns being dismissed. And one thing I've seen in you know, some of the pushback to this idea that we need to have a consistent rule against political violence is, well, you know, are you seriously comparing trying to overthrow a fair and free election with, uh, you know, blatant police brutality? You know, there's no moral equivalence. And when we talk about game theory, you know, we're not talking about morality. We're talking about what actually happens. You know, I've uh, I've got a, a piece I'm working on which uh, admits guiltily to wasting way too much time uh, on computer games way past the time when I was too old for that. Uh, like civilization or Europa Universalis. You are and, kind of a constitutional nerd. You know that, right? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah, but okay, you know, I, I do some cool stuff too, and I'm not. <laughs> totally the idea is in these games, there's usually some measure of social cohesion. If you get your little sim citizens mad enough, they're going to re rebel, or your tax collections go down, your policing costs go up, and you got to deal with that. You can either move some more soldiers into the city and, you know, they can suppress your rebellions by force, or you can throw the Sims a bone and, and make them feel happy. The point is, it doesn't matter if their grievances are moral. What happens is their perception. And if we make an exception to this rule, no political violence in a republic, the problem is you don't get to decide what your other side thinks is just enough to warrant resorting to the emergency measures like political violence. You know, if you say, well, you can only use political violence in a just cause, like mine, the other side's going to say, well, you know, mine's just. Uh, so why should I not start? The only way this works, it, you know, both of us in a democracy have made a bargain that we're going to settle our disagreements peacefully, even though we know sometimes we'll lose, even sometimes about things that we really care about. Because as I say, the transaction costs of having to settle all of our disputes by shooting each other, that's a lot higher than losing once in a while. We don't want that. We can't have that. Otherwise, we won't have a republic. So, okay, I love the idea of the social contract, and I get that. 
and I get that we have decided in a social contract to come together, you know, held by the constitution with our differences, knowing that we're not always, you know, one side sometimes going to be the winner, the other side, you know, we're not always going to be hundred percent pleased. And that's part of the social contract so that we live here together. We live here in somewhat harmony, but could you say with the um, black lives matter and the violence that we saw this summer, if they argued that the social contract with them had been broken, would that be a legitimate reason for them to use violence? Considering that the they, uh, you know, whoever was part of the Black Lives Matter movement did not feel that they were involved in the social contract from the beginning. That's probably their strongest argument. Right. Uh, but then at the same time, they've lost the standing to object to other people's violence who also think that uh, the contract no longer applies. You can think that if you think, obviously, that uh, elections are corrupt, that uh, the what they call the uniparty, the powers that be, will do whatever it takes to keep a, quote, fascist dictator out of the White House, then, well, you're not in republic either. Uh this is definitely a in case of fire break glass mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not sure what i could say to to people to convince them that that uh, the ordinary uh, avenues of politics are completely hopeless you know we we've seen a, a dramatic decline although most people don't know this because uh, it may not make it doesn't serve agendas to report this accurately, but the uh, the rate of police shootings and also the disproportion of police shootings between whites and African Americans has dropped dramatically since the 70s. Uh, there's a fashion, there's a sense that you can't acknowledge progress, otherwise you're minimizing or defending what injustice still remains. Mm. But you know, I am nerdy or maybe even a you know pathological about truth, and. I like to know what is, and if if you really drill down into the evidence uh, and follow it where it leads, it, it's very hard to make the case that there are no remedies at all for police brutality. Uh, we there are definitely some changes that we need to make, and it's funny a bunch of the libertarian nerds were screaming about that long before Black Lives Matter was even a thing. Uh, you know, there's some mechanisms in our government that allow police to get away with, with abuse way too often. And there's some practical ways we can do that. The, the downside of the Black Lives Matter a movement, which is basically to say that America is flawed and irredeemable from the beginning, I think that winds up maybe doing more harm than, uh, than not. Because the single biggest driver of police shootings is violent crime. You know, there are not that many police shootings in places that there is not much violent crime, if only because there isn't that much policing there. Uh, and if you drive the crime rate back up by alienation, uh, by you know, knee you know, handicapping the legitimate activities of police, then you're going to get more people killed, and not just by criminals killing each other, but by the police. We have this sort of moral way of looking at the world where we don't look at the bottom line and it, it just leads and I, I wrote something about the california high-speed rail and how that's a function of that same thing the other day uh we don't look at the details we look at our moral feelings and then we ignore everything else and it sometimes makes us do really stupid things you know on that point i am going to agree with you and um you know, I think talking about the police brutality is a, is a whole nother podcast, but I do feel that we have gotten away from uh, a lot of truth with regards to that. Uh, and I, one of the things, so let, bringing it back though to the Capitol incident, one of the things that I had the biggest problem with was we immediately went to race. So it wasn't, or a lot of social media, a lot of media immediately went to race. If this was uh, Black Lives Matter that were was storming the Capitol, the response would have been different. Uh, that police treat people different, and you know, I that that even though I completely disagree with what happened, that I, I, I that narrative is just false, and it it makes me angry that we immediately go there. Are there problems with race that we need to address? Absolutely, but we went there you know without even 
without question. And in this instance, I mean, while there could have been some Capitol Police, and I hope that they're investigating, I think they are investigating that let people in that may have been white supremacists, that may have sided with Trump, who knows? But, you know, we had a woman shot in the neck. And we, in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, there was more time where people were prepared, where the police were under attack, where police were literally like, you know, police stations were set on fire with them inside of it. And we had incidents where governors and mayors and, and, and city leaders were telling the police to stand down. And so to make that, you know, that uh, parallel, I really, that's where I had the biggest problem was was with them saying, okay, if, if, if this was a bunch of black, you know, Lives Matter people, it would have been different. I have a problem with that. And and that's even, you know, probably, again, that goes into the police issue and, and maybe a discussion for another podcast. But I want to get to Trump. I want to get to whether or not this was incitement. Uh, I do feel, and I think that you and I differ on this. Did he actually say, go storm the Capitol? No, of course he didn't. Yeah, I mean, no. not not of course, but no, he d- he did not say that. No, you've got the transcript. Uh, right. Go protest. Go make your voice heard peacefully and patriotically. You know, but he there was there was like so much more there to it. I, he did not once the violence started. He did not immediately come out and condemn it. Uh, we've got other people like Ted Cruz. We've got Rudy Gi- Giuliani. You know, saying what was it like a trial by combat? I mean, there was like. Have you heard the whole the whole speech that uh, Giuliani was saying? No, no. So, so, enlighten. Oh well, I I, I want to let you finish your point. Uh, no, without... that was that was kind of my my point is I feel like there was more there that was yeah. inciting. So so, but I I don't. So know his phrase this. was he he said I'm I'm again quoting from memory. He said, "Let's have a trial by combat." You know, if we have this. 10 day uh, pause on certification of the election results. And we do a deep dive audit into whether it's fraud. If there wasn't, then we will look like fools. And if there was, you know, you guys will go to jail. Mm. Uh, that's what was immediately surrounding the quote trial by combat. And I, it, you know, it would take, I, I think it's a stretch to say, let's go out and fight it out in the Capitol floor. I think the trial by combat was meant as a trial by reputations. So again, you know, then you get into questions of negligence and, you know, what's foreseeable for this, for people to hear. But he definitely wasn't explicitly calling for, quote, imminent lawless action, which is what we'll be talking about as you get further into the law of incitement. Right. Well, tell me more about that. Uh, let, let, let's go there now. Let's go get into the law of incitement. You know, I, I, I thank you for clarifying that because, of course, the media only said trial by combat, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't serve their purpose to, to give the whole uh, the, the whole transcript. My yeah. rule with these people is direct quotes with at least five sentences on either side or it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, I like that. Direct quote. I'm going to quote you on that. Direct quotes with at least five sentences on either side or it didn't happen. Right. Brilliant. I like that. That said, I still feel, and so let's, I'll tell you my feelings and let's get into um, the whole law of incitement. I do feel that there was at the very least, Tom, negligence. I, you know, we knew that there was this group of, of people who had come for the rally, who I, I'm sure the FBI knew, and I'm sure like our, I, I, or I'm not sure. No, I'd like to think, I mean, we weren't obviously prepared. I'd like to think that there was some idea that some people came for more nefarious reasons. And the language that he used was not calming. It was not, so at the very least, it was not presidential. Was it? In- so I don't think we disagree on that. And I wrote a, a fairly long essay distinguishing incitement from you know, arguably uh, a violation of the president's duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed and to not do anything that would impede them or or put the government across purposes. Um, So I guess, would you like me to go into some background on the the mechanics of incitement? Please do, yeah. So we had had back in the, the first, quote, Red Scare, the one in 1919, you know, the A&W root beer year, the pandemic year, uh, 
Woodrow Wilson, who was probably the closest to a genuine fascist president the United States has ever had, uh, got a law passed that criminalized as sedition anything that tended to interfere with the draft or the prosecution of World War I. Uh, one of uh, Wilson's uh, challengers from the left was the socialist candidate Eugene Debs. Uh, Debs was a, was a big figure back in early 20th century politics. Uh, he gave a speech opposing the draft. Wilson threw him in jail for sedition. He ran his presidential campaign from prison. Uh, for a long time, and, and that, that law was upheld by the Supreme Court. It's where Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the famous line about you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. You know, it's kind of a, a, a commonplace by Facebook lawyers across the fruited plain. And they don't know necessarily that that decision in which it appeared was overruled in 1969. Uh, Back before 69, uh, incitement was a lot looser. You know, if you said something that got it, that stirreth up the people, as the King James Bible uh, records the crowd saying of Jesus once, uh, you could be punished for it. And, uh, the Brandenburg versus Ohio decision in 1969 uh, dialed that way back in the name of the First Amendment. In order to be incitement, to be criminal, uh, you need your speech needs to be directed intentionally directed to causing imminent lawless action. What's called mere advocacy isn't enough. You know, if you say, I think, you know, the United States is illegitimate from the beginning and we need a revolution by any means necessary. You can't go to jail. That's perfectly legitimate. Uh, I think you're, you know, you're wrong and, you know, we'll have some more talk about that, but you cannot be prosecuted or punished or sanctioned at all for that. Uh, if you say to somebody, okay, Bob, you go down to the courthouse and break the window. Fred, you toss a Molotov cocktail in. And if you know that they're both going to do it, or if you really expect them to do it, then that's getting close to where you can be hauled off to the pokey. Uh, in this case, for Trump to have committed legal incitement, this dog whistle business doesn't work. You need direct advocacy of imminent lawless action. You might have had imminent lawless action. You know, it might have been reasonably foreseeable that this crowd would go down to the Capitol and somebody would do something illegal at least. Uh, but unless Trump said, go down and storm the Capitol and take the legislature prisoner and keep me the president, uh, it would not be legally incitement, legal incitement. Now, whether uh, the same standard applies to impeachment is a totally another story. And maybe I'll let you respond and we can talk about that too. No, but we, I, need to be, I, we need to be clear. I mean, this is not, this is very clear by, according to virtually all legal scholars, that legally this is not incitement. It may be the colloquial meaning of incitement, mm -hmm. but as far as the actual crime, it's not. Okay, so let's go there. If I understand you correctly, legally, while what he did was unpresidential, perhaps, or at least I would yeah. say you no, would I, I, I agree. agree. Yeah, no not, disagreement. Not incitement by the law. Well, let's go to impeachment. Is it is it impeachment worthy? So Congress doesn't have to have, uh, doesn't have to cite a statutory violation to impeach you. The standard is high crimes and misdemeanors. And if you look at the, the background of the Constitutional Convention, there was actually an argument of whether there had to be an actual crime or whether just maladministration would be enough. And as the, comp the Constitution was a, a big mess of compromises, they wound up compromising on something that didn't really say either. They used a phrase from the English common law that uh, arguably could include uh, maladministration as well as actual crimes. Strictly speaking, Congress is the only body that gets to weigh in on whether uh, conduct is impeachable. Courts don't get to, really don't get to say anything about it. It's a separation of powers issue. Congress could say that, I just don't like the way you look. I think you talk mean about people. I think that's high crimes and misdemeanors. Get, you know, get out of here. And in fact, uh, when Andrew Johnson was impeached back in 18, I should know, the 68, don't, don't look that up. Uh, you, you can quote like all this constitutional stuff. So you need- Yeah, well, Andrew Johnson was by- far by miles the worst the worst most destructive president the united states ever had something about the name john no offense to to good johnsons or uh, just leave that aside too but uh uh 
both presidents named Johnson have sucked, but Andrew Johnson was so far, be- he was drunk, he was racist, badly racist, I mean, viciously racist. He basically destroyed Reconstruction, and I'm going off on a huge tangent. If anybody deserved impeachment, he did. Uh, but as it happened, the radical Republicans in Congress impeached him for, uh, one, a violation of an unconstitutional statute, the Tenure in Office Act, and two, for, quote, intemperate and contemptuous remarks towards Congress. Now, it turned out he was acquitted because a lot of Republicans in Congress said, well, yeah, we are kind of contemptible and we deserve <laughs> contemptuous rhetoric. You know, we don't want to impede the, the, the president's right to speak intemperately about us because we don't want to lose our right to speak intemperately about him. He's a jerk. He, he's a complete loser. So I mean, as, as it happened, you, you don't, bottom line is you don't need uh, a statutory violation to impeach, but every single impeachment to date has alleged a statutory violation. Uh, the article of impeachment against President Trump, you know, 2.0, was for incitement of insurrection. And I've got some serious problems with that. And I've been talking for a long time. You want to ask me what they are or should I go on? No, keep going. Yeah. So like I said, Congress can impeach the president for anything it wants. Uh, but when it borrows the language of an actual statutory crime, uh, I think it's important that the elements of that crime, what need to be proven to show it, are present. Uh, I don't want incitement of insurrection to mean one thing for purposes of the law and another thing for purposes of something else. Because if President Trump did say things that are are uh, you know constitutionally protected, and he's punished for it. I think we're eroding the you know, the protections we have to speak even about inflammatory topics. You know, China would lo- loves right to cite security as a reason for shutting anybody up who rocks the boat. I don't want to give government the power to say, well, these these are dangerous things to talk about. We need to you know make sure you don't speak it. Um, on the other hand, and I've acknowledged this. Uh, the president is the chief executive officer, the head of the head of the executive branch. He's taken an oath to see that the laws are faithfully executed. And if he does something to work across purposes to that, if he even if he just reasonably foresees that a riot is going to happen and he's like, I'm, well, I didn't call for it. You know, I I'm on the fence about impeachment. I don't, the biggest thing I don't like about it is using the term incitement out of context because it's reinforcing, I think, a broader uh, trend to do that and to criminalize dissent. And I think that's probably more dangerous than having Donald Trump around for another week. Um, you know, that said, he did not perform as the president should perform. Yeah. And I would have no problem at all censuring him for it. I just don't think incitement to insurrection uh, is an appropriate uh, charge for impeachment at this point. Okay. And I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying and I can appreciate that. I guess what I've seen that some people who are calling for impeachment, I guess what, if you are legit impeachable, then you don't get the, you know, secret service. You, you don't get the bennies of being an ex president if you are actually impeached. So some people are saying it's worth it to continue on with this, even past next week, even past when he's, you know, no longer the president, because it would strip him of some of the benefits of being a next president, which there are, there are plenty of benefits of that. So that's, and, and, and that's not a, you know, that's, that's an argument that I can kind of get on board with, you know, I mean, first of all, he's got enough money, so he doesn't need, you know, if he wants secret service, he can hire his own, but for those reasons alone, and also I feel like, do you feel, this is a hard one, do you feel like if we impeach him, that that would create some healing or it would actually make things worse? I mean, I know there are people who, people who really, really are Trump supporters who, if we impeach him, would like go off the rails for sure. But I think that it also might create some healing. And I'm just not sure which one is worse. And maybe maybe it is just like you said, like, like he's got a week left, like, let it go. Well, I mean, let's to be technical and nerdy again. I mean, he has been impeached. 
uh, right, right, right. twice now, but you're talking about convicted and removed. Right, and right. what makes it even stranger is that it looks like the Senate's not even going to take up impeachment until after the transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some constitutional questions uh, about whether that's proper, whether you can impeach somebody who is no longer the president. There's one precedent back from the 1870s, including a judge, Belknap, who tried to resign before they could before they could remove him. And the Senate went ahead and impeached him, uh, but acquitted him. Uh, it turns out they didn't remove him. They didn't. They did. So there actually is no precedent for an ex office holder to be successfully impeached. Uh, on balance, I don't think the. I think it would do more harm than good to remove him, mm. or if, not remove him. Right, impeach him after he's been removed. I think the uh, the satisfaction of removing his Secret Service protection and maybe the political advantage of of uh, removing him from. Uh, Ever being future. able to run again. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and you and you understand what that is. So the 14th Amendment also, in addition to protecting everybody from, uh, you know, giving everybody the equal protection of the laws, Section 3 uh, disqualified anybody who had participated in rebellion or insurrection, you know, the former Confederates, from being a legislator or president or any officer unless they had their rights restored. Uh what they're trying to do is basically tag Trump with Section 3, claiming that this was an insurrection. Uh, and I've got some other thoughts about how serious that is and how dangerous that is, especially uh, if we're going to start calibrating violence and decide, you know, what counts as an insurrection or, and what doesn't. You know, Hit us. Go, 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 go. That well, way. OK, so long time story. I don't know if you were still in California then, but back during the 92 uh, L.A. riots, uh, you know, we were in Orange County, things were generally safe, but I had driven up to LA to, to visit my uh, 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 friend of mine who was uh, at the UCLA Medical Center and was sick. And I got stuck coming home in a massive traffic jam containing, uh, you know, full of trucks with troops going back to Camp Pendleton. I never thought I would see in America, my America, the streets that I recognize, you know, troops in you know, full battle gear, you know, these open back trucks sitting around me looking at my little, you know, gold Saturn. And <laughs> I, I, it definitely felt ominous, different, you know, not what we're supposed to be. Uh, this is, we have, uh, you know, a congressman, Maxine Waters, who didn't like those being called riots. She thought they should be called a rebellion, an uprising. And I always wonder, you know, what's the difference between an insurrection and a rebellion and a revolution or an uprising? And why is a revolution so much cooler you know, why do we make movies that are going to get Oscar nominations about the trial of the Chicago Seven who were trying to disrupt, you know, the, an electoral process, the Democratic 1968 convention? Uh, why do we romanticize the weathermen who saw, by God, bombs in the Capitol? Uh, the company you keep, Robert Redford. Uh, these people go on to be tenured professors. They go on to be colleagues with former presidents. Uh, that's the kind of asymm asymmetry, which I, I think I'm concerned about. And if we're going to call this riot an insurrection, uh, I think I, I think a, people, a lot of people have this sense that they'll be in power forever and the precedents they set can never be used against them. Uh, I would not want my enemies uh, saying that, well, you know, your riot got a little bit too close to the bone. Uh, if you squint just right, we can see this as a challenge to legitimate authority, just like the Capitol riot was. So we're going to call it an insurrection, and we're going to say that anybody who advocated the cause that it was motivated by is a co-conspirator, uh, giving aid and comfort to insurrectionists. You can't be in office. Maxine, take a hike. You're out of the Congress. Nancy Pelosi, when you said that the Wisconsin riot was a beautiful example of democracy in action, you're out of here. It's just too easy, you know, uh, I am, again, a fanatic about keeping the channels of communication and truth clear. And if legitimate dissent winds up getting uh, criminalized, we are screwed. Because you, know, you remember John Kennedy's line, those who make peaceful, there's a change of revolution impossible, make violent revolution inevitable. I do not like the nut jobs on the QAnon left. I think they're crazy. I think they smell bad. I think they would probably as soon you know, kill me as not. Back when Trump was running, right, right. The QAnon right, yeah. Okay, I mean, I don't want to be governed by those people, right, any more than I want to be governed by people who think that uh, you know the CIA invented the crack cocaine epidemic or AIDS to cause genocide of black people. We've got a, a wave of conspiracy theory around this country, and if we lose our democracy, you know, those dice roll and they may turn up with just 
ungodly people in power, even if they're, quote, on my side. I don't want to be subject to those people. I want to be able to keep arguing and reasoning together, and I don't want to come anywhere close to those that cliff. And I think we're really playing with fire here. You make a really good argument. I mean, that that that, that it is hard to to argue with it. I mean, uh, I think that's no, because lot... the screwdriver is virgin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why you have, have a career as a constitutional lawyer. All those virgin screwdrivers. Honestly, if uh, you know, I've got some very nice bourbon in my cabinet, which I use for my patented barbecue sauce. Again, you know, it's I don't drink for religious reasons, but if anything could make me want to go to that bottle and just crack it open, uh, it's been the last couple of weeks. I'm telling you what, I mean, I know why you don't drink, but it's like I kind of was thinking about that earlier before we got on this. I was like, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, honestly, you know. There are times when I wish I had more help from Evan Williams. <laughs> okay. So speaking of which, uh, speaking of drinks, I'm almost, almost done with my drink. And I, I think that we, this is, we've got many more follow-up conversations here. There's a bunch of things that I'd like to go in more depth with you with like brutality and police and the actual like reaction of the Capitol Police. But for today, as we're looking at this transition, what do you think about, is is there any place for political violence at all? And I feel like you've already answered that, but what would you say to those? And I know you've been having these discussions to those who say that there is, what is your like final word for them that would you feel impress upon them that it's a slippery slope? You allow it here, it goes there. What are some of your final thoughts on that? So in an essay, I'm trying to, I'm circulating right now. I, I'm referring to, uh, that great cult movie, The Hunt for Red October, with Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, you've seen it, I hope? I, I have, and I think this is an essay that I've already, like, your, your at least draft of it, I've published, right? Yeah, I, well, and then I, 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 I borrowed from that to do some other things. Uh, random uh, trivia, I, uh, you know, Fred Thompson, the Russians don't take a dump, sir, without making a plan. I got to throw him out at second base once at a uh, Senate uh, intern softball game. It was a good sport. Uh, but, you know, he, he says that there's a KGB spy trying to blow up the missile room of the defecting Russian submarine to keep it from falling into the Americans' hands. And he's out there trying to launch the motor to melt the whole ship. And, uh, you know, Sean Connery is telling Alec Baldwin, you know, be careful what you shoot at. Some things here don't react well to bullets. And so Alec Baldwin goes in. The other guy just blazes away randomly at him. And he j- dives for cover. I have to be careful what I shoot at. And we do, because this is our country. This, uh, yeah. this is a far better vehicle, as it now, even as it now is, with all its flaws, to redress the, the grievances that people are so often very justly angry about. And another, another ship is not going to be as good. I don't think we have any right to expect that what could follow uh, what the founders built is going to protect us as well and as long as ours has. And so whenever you think, well, you know, we can we can cheat a little because because a little pile of violence will get results. And uh, we really feel strongly about this cause. You know, maybe so. You know, we you're rolling the iron dice and sooner or later that comes up craps. Uh, is that something that we can risk? And at this point in our history, I don't think it is. You know, and, and, and on that Doug. note, <laughs> I've got a sip left. So on that note, I, I, that's, that's, I think one of my biggest fears too, is knowing me being in international relations, understanding, you know, not, I, not to the extent that I'm native, but understanding maybe more than your average uh, American uh, Chinese motives, Russian motives, whatnot. I mean, I, my first reaction was not domestic when we saw this happen. My first reaction was this image of Putin and Xi Jinping sitting back with a drink, maybe even on a Zoom yeah. call like we are I'm going- I'm pretty sure his screwdriver wasn't virgin. Yeah, going cheers, you know, or whatever. In, in Chinese, it'd be ganbei, and yeah. in Russian, it'd be what? Bro. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just going, we didn't even have to do anything, guys. Yeah, seriously. You know? And so for that reason, that reason more than any of the others, I think that we need to find a way to work this out or other, other, otherwise we will be under the thumb 
of people that we don't want to. Yeah. I mean, if this were a computer game, the social cohesion bar would be flashing red. You know, we can either crush the opposition and hope it's just the opposition's fault and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we take a step back from the brink. We throw them a few bones. Yeah, we remove the grievances from those we can persuade and try to isolate the crazies we can't. Uh, but, you know, I'm not optimistic with what's with the responses right now. And we could have a whole other, I think, discussion about uh, the response to the Capitol riot, uh, because I think it's probably going to surpass McCarthyism as far as are you now or have you ever been a member of a conservative party? Uh, the reaction to 9-11 was probably worse for civil liberties than 9-11 was. Uh, certainly the the uh, aftermath of the Reichstag fire in 1933 was much worse than the actual legislature being attacked. Well, so, I think with that we absolutely need to plan to have that discussion. We'll give it maybe a few weeks for things to to, to kind of sift, to, sift through, you know, all the, the, the chaos that we're in in this trip. Yeah. But I think that's really important. And that that worries me. And that's a discussion I want to have with you, because I really do feel like the uh, parties are in disarray. I feel like the GOP is in disarray. And a lot of that is is it some not some of it is internal and some of it is external. And it, some of that yeah. internal is that uh, McCarthyism towards conservatism. And the problem with that is that we need balance. We need balance. And well, we're unbalanced. Yeah, and if you make if you make legitimate dissent uh, unacceptable, it in polite society it finds a way to ex express itself in impolite society, and then it gets co opted by maybe very dark forces. Uh, I, I think it's in all of our interest to to not just cast the deplorables aside, root and branch, to recognize that you know some of what they're talking about is real, just like again some of what. You know, BLM is talking about is real, even though I think some of their premises are badly wrong. Uh, you can't just say, we're just going to suppress you completely. We're going to run you out. We're going to, I mean, Kurt Schilling basically got his insurance cut off because he said, you know, intemperate things about the Capitol riot. Uh, the Chinese social credit system is is a big, is a real thing. And I swear, you know, we decided to open up to China with the hope that we would promote democracy. And it looks like the relationships working the other way. You know, we're importing their values. That social credit thing is real. And no, it's terrifying. And it's, it's, it's terrifying. happening. Yeah. And just to give our listeners a little background on that, I mean, that is where everything, every post you make, every email you send, every tag you make is calculated in a system within the Chinese government and it gives you a social credit and that allows you to travel. That allows you to get certain jobs. And so if we get to a place where we're having that social credit system, um, you're right. That's that's dangerous. And and I do see that happening. I think that there is some legit pushback against that, but it's it is frightening. It yeah. is frightening. So that will be our conversation. We'll let we'll we'll let things um kind of filter through for the next week or two so that we can reassess i know between now and then there'll be like every five minutes there'll be a new catastrophe that we'll want to talk about but i think that like our next conversation needs to be on that for sure and that as well as or maybe it's two more conversations that and 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 dealing with uh police issues and, and brutality yeah well let's pray that uh, our next conversation doesn't have to be on what flavor of mres are best you know because civilization is broken down completely you know let's pray that you know, wise heads prevail and, and uh, stupid heads are lazy. <laughs> well, here's I mean, I seriously wonder if, if President Trump at the end of his speech had said, and for God's sake, don't do anything stupid, right. would that have mattered? And I, I'm not sure it would have, you know, that the timeline seems to be that the people who were bent on and attacking the Capitol were already underway at that point. I and think I think that, though. well, uh, that'll be something to look into. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, here is, you know, to hopefully 20 minutes at least of peace. <laughs> I will take it. Until the next time, Tom. <laughs> yes. Till the next time. Thanks, Jen. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold My Drink. 
like or subscribe to the show and check out the show notes for links to source material and to our website where you can find what each of us is reading every week, different news with different views. If you have a topic that you would like us to explore, drop us a line. And join us next week as we say, hold my drink and the conversation gets real.